All right, so tonight we are going to talk about dark lagers. So dark beer introduction. Uh, dark beers, uh, not always trusted. Rumors of Bach being the bottom of the barrel. The expectation is dark is synonymous with strong, and statements that dark beers are heavier with more calories. And we got a video that's going to play in a second. As soon as I walk back and hit the magic button here. And you guys may have seen this commercial just recently. So, so you can see they're kind of playing off that theme about, you know, dark beers aren't to be trusted. If you notice, there were some other themes that were going on in there, too. But um, that's sort of kind of, you know, where people have been historically with dark beers. We're going to we're going to tell you something different about dark beers in this presentation. So we're going to go over uh, dark lager styles, the history of dark lagers, and we're going to talk about the BJCP dark lager style guidelines. There's a handful of them. We'll cover most of them. Um, we're going to talk about uh, talk about and sample the important part, um, some of the classic commercial examples, and then uh, we'll have a section at the end uh, talking about if you want to homebrew a dark lager, some things you need to be aware of in the process. Uh, so the 2021 BJCP dark lager styles uh, that we're going to go over, uh, we got international dark lager, we got a Czech dark lager, uh, Dunkelsbach, Munich Dunkel, Schwartz beer, Doppelbach, Eisbach, Baltic Porter, and other. That all, all important other category. That's where Greg, uh, Greg's, Greg's smiling because that's where his, that's where he plays in the other category. I, I think that's where a lot of the engineers play is in the other category. All right, so a uh, history of dark lager uh, in the dark ages. Uh, lagers mostly dark until 1840s. Uh, malt kilned in wood oven or a smoker. And Munich, it was mostly dark until World War II. Uh, yeast roll in beer not understood at that time. Uh, lager reference, uh, cold storage, not yeast. So it's not necessarily using different type of yeast, but it's just the cold storage process of it. Um, cold fermentation practices uh, favored the health of lager strain. Uh, poor selection of good yeast by favoring conditions for taste. And I'm, I'm going to blow through the history a little bit because we got a lot of beer to sample. So if, if I'm going a little too fast, you got a question, please ask. But I think we want to get to the important part. Uh, so uh, 1516, uh, Reich gets Bach. I knew I was going to screw that up. I even, pra I even practiced it earlier today. So um, uh, German purity law, we've heard about it many times. Basically, brewing beer with malt, hops, and water. And that's it, nothing else. Um, so in 1553, uh, summer brewing was outlawed in Bavaria uh, with a recognition that cold fermentation improves quality. So they were already trying to find things to improve the process by pushing it more towards the winter months. Uh, in 1817, a uh, hot air kilned drum roaster was invented, um, which gives you a uniform malt kilning, which leads to Munich malt. In 1840, uh, more modern techniques were introduced to Germany. Um, and uh, Gabriel Settlemar, one of the important people in the process of that. History of lighter lagers. 1841, you had the introduction of amber lagers. Uh, Anton Dreyer developed the Vienna style. In 1842, introduction of light lagers. Pilsner Urkel, the first light lager. In 1894, Hellas lager, produced by Spaten. And it was needed to compete with the popularity of Pilsners at the time. Other key events in history, 1838 to 1840, first lager brewed in America, and it would have been dark. 1870s, invention of refrigeration. And in 1878, Louis Pasteur discovers yeast function and fermentation. So as you can see, as things are progressing, we're getting more towards what we know of dark lagers. Uh, in 1890, Emil Hansen at Carlsberg uh, develops a technique to cultivate pure yeast strains. The thing that's amazing about that to me is that, you know, w without even knowing that yeast was you wanted the ingredients, uh, one of the necessities to make beer. And all of these beers that we've been produced for, you know, ages and ages. And finally, it takes, you know, up until 1878, where we're almost into the 1900s before you realize that yeast is an important to the brewing process. Patrick.
Yeah, that's a, I think that a, a lot of those beers had some sourness to it. And the, the, the key was to trying to make it so that it wasn't, so they didn't have that much sour. So people were drinking, trying to drink things fresher, more local things, uh, because uh, as they would age, they would tend to, to go sour. And so you hear like in some of the, some of the, like when you talk about porters and porters were originated from, you know, blending beers together. And they would typically blend some a beer that was like a fresh beer, and they blend one that was an old, you know, beer that would that meant it had some sourness to it. Mm-hmm. Fermenting in wood—that's a great place to pick up uh, sour cultures. Uh, typically, what you would do is, is that if you fermented a beer and you you drank the beer, if the beer tasted bad, then that meant it was a bad barrel, and you got rid of the barrel. And so then we got this what you call forced selection. And so it means that you just keep forcing the things out that that aren't making the beer the way that you like it, and you end up things end up migrating towards where where you want these to go. And it's probably true not only just for like you know the normal beers, but also for for the uh, uh, Belgian lambics, for example. You know these things uh, when they get a, beer, a barrel and the barrel doesn't give them the beer that they the way they want it, they get rid of that barrel. Andy, international yeah, dark so lager style. As you saw, there are quite a quite a number of different dark lager styles that are in the BJCP guidelines. So we're going to go through them, and we have uh, examples. And every single example that you're going to be tasting tonight is on the BJCP list, saying that this is a good example of, for the style. Doesn't mean that they're all going to taste the same. In fact, it, it, we will have, and at least one of the categories will have more than one to taste in that category. And so you can actually see how something can be in the same category, but taste different. There's, there's a, basically a range of, of allowable tastes within a particular style. So the first one we want to cover is the international dark lager style. And this is, um, oftentimes people think about this style as being, you know, you take your, your light lager, you give it a little bit of color, and suddenly it's a dark lager. I can remember being over at, I went to, uh, uh, Coors and went to tour their brewery a number very many years ago. And um, there were two things that I was that sort of impressed me. One of them, or depressed me, however you want to look at it. One of them was that they, they talk about this Rocky Mountain water and oh, this, this, you think about this great, you know, clear river that's coming in there. And then I went to the brewery and there's this brown uh, river coming into the brewery. And I was like, that wasn't what I was expecting. Now, of course, they're filtering and all that kind of stuff. But when I went through the tour, at the end of the tour, they give you the taste on there. And they had a number of different beers that they had on the taste there. And they all sort of tasted the same, even though they had different colors to them. There was so much that there was that more in common than they, than they did uh, uh, differences. And so I think that's one way to look at this style right here. And if I could get um, somebody to help me um, pass out some of these beers, we're going to try one of the, yeah. So we're going to try uh, a Scheinerbach is the one that we're going to try. It's in the uh, paper. It's the one in the paper uh, um, carton there. Yeah, and I think if we can, yeah, let's see if 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 maybe we pour three of three of them or something like that, to get around the room. And so um, I'm going to move on to this. But you can see that we have the specs here, um, and. The note here that it's oftentimes that what what's done with the lager is they just added some, you know, caramel or darker malts to the same beer that they were already making, and that's how they would make this beer. Um, it's typically a uh, you know lower ABV beer, uh, and so that's what we'll be that's what we'll be trying here. So let's talk a little bit about Scheinerbach right here. The name Bach is actually a misnomer. This is something that happened uh, early in, you know. Uh, American uh, uh, beer history is that box became synonymous with dark beers. I guess they knew enough about a Bach beer that came from Germany to know that it was usually dark. And so when you saw dark beer, you just said, well, that's a Bach beer. And so even though it's called Shiner Bach, it's not really a Bach beer. It's really a, 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 an international dark lager, an American dark lager. Um, Shiner Brewery uh, itself they were. Uh, they started from uh, German and uh, Czech immigrants. They wanted to brew things in in that tradition, and this particular beer was was brewed as a uh, a seasonal beer, uh, but it gained a lot of popularity over time. And so now it's probably 
if not the maybe the, the most popular of these types of beers, or maybe the second one of these dark beers. It really has quite a big follow, following in terms of, of, of production. Um, they were, uh, uh, um, let's see, what else can I say? 4.4% ABV. And so um, did everybody get a sample of this? All right, so I'd, I'd like to hear what you guys think about it. What, what are your, some of you probably have had this beer before. So you, any comments on what? Stan. German lager yeast? German lager yeast, that's what Stan says. Yes. That's where it started. That was the origins. So Lent is a time of typical, you give something up for Lent as leads up to the Easter holiday. And I'm wondering, what are you giving up to get to drink Bach beer, Shiner, for Lent? Because I want in. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure I can answer that, but maybe that's why it became, uh, it's not a seasonal beer anymore. So um, you give up light beer. Um, so I, it, this is- Andy, real quick. If you look at it, um, I mean, if you take a look at the color on it, some of the dark beers you'll see there's a different levels of dark. Some of them will get all the way to black. Um, but oftentimes a dark beer is more of a dark amber. This is sort of on the lighter amber amber side, you know, so of, of what you would see for a dark beer. But this is listed as a, uh, uh, in the BGCP guidelines as a, as a, as a uh, example for the style. I think I have an answer to Jacques' question. I don't know if it's a folk's tale or real back here. Um, but what I was told is that when uh, the monks wanted to use this um, for Lent, they were not eating any food. They're completely fasting except for the Bach. And they had to get the Pope's permission. And so they took it to the Pope. And in the journey, it soured. And the Pope said, well, if you're willing to drink this, please do. So I have no idea if that's true or not, but that is what I have heard. It's, it sounds true, so. There, there is some truth to uh, 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 some of the, 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 fasting, uh, the fasting stories around the, these beers. And typically the, the beers that you, that when you're saying we're gonna fast and the only thing we can do is drink and we can drink beers, typically they would, those types of beers would end up being beers that had a lot of uh, your residual malts in them. So you're getting nutrients from the beer as well. And we'll be trying a couple of those examples later, later in the program. So um, I saw Chris, uh, Chris, did you get a sample of this, Scheinerbach? Okay. All right, good, I'm gonna move on to the next one. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the Czech dark lager uh, style. Uh, Czech beers have been, uh, it's been difficult to get a lot of these styles, you know, examples of these styles here in the US. And I think the last time that we did this presentation, which, I, which is, was somewhere around eight years ago, um, I don't know how many people were here in the club eight years ago when we did this presentation. <laughs> Jacques like, I know all the material for this. <laughs> um, so we couldn't find uh, that uh, we, we couldn't find distribution on them, but um, we'll, we'll talk about why we're able to get distribution now. Uh, so this beer right here, the Czech dark lager style is uh, um, it's, it's, I think maybe closer related to the Czech lighter lager style than, than maybe anything else. You think about something that where they've taken their, the, you know, a Czech uh, Pilsner type beer, and they've added uh, dark caramel malts to it. You'll get, um, you know, some fruity flavors to it, a um, little bit of, a little bit of uh, roastiness to it, but not much. Uh, it's t still a uh, lower gravity beer. You can see uh, BJCP guidelines four and a half to five point eight. Um, yeah, and so I think what we'll do is we'll let's pass around uh, the example that we have on this, and we'll talk a little bit about this beer right here. So, if you guys want to grab the uh, Samson 1795. I'll tell you a little bit about this. Um, this is a Czech lager brewed by the original, or one of the original Budweisers, before uh, you know, before Budweiser created was created here in the U.S. Uh, Budvar in uh, Seske Budo uh, or Bud Budweis is what the Germans call the the, uh, the city, and um, this 
brewery was founded in 1795. And they were founded because there was another brewery in Budweiss that was, uh, that was endorsed by the king. And so they basically wanted to make a people's version of it. And so there were actually two other sort of Budweiser breweries before the US uh, uh, brewery, um, Budweiser brewery uh, came into existence. And so that resulted in a uh, trademark dispute, not just with two entities, but with three entities. And so uh, that's kind of what was going on. There's a trademark dispute. Um, the funny thing is, the funny thing is that now uh, uh, Budweiser combined with InBev, and they ended up buying this brewery. And so now it's distributed <laughs> from them. They're distributing it, so now you can get it. Uh, they you they went back to the uh, one of their uh, an earlier name that they had taken on called Samson. And that was in the time when uh, when the Czech Republic came under the uh, under the Iron Curtain, and uh, they were looking for simpler names that people could pronounce, uh, and so they ended up uh, this was ended up being one of the names that they were using, Samson, and so now um, now this beer is actually marketed as Samson 1795 uh, Dark Lager, so you can see it's a uh, four and a half percent ABV. It's uh, listed as a Czech, Czech dark lager classic uh, for, the, for the style, and you can get it. So every beer you're going to get uh, tonight was sourced either at uh, Total Wine and more or at BevMo. So it's all, you can find these beers around. Um, that's the good news. So, okay, what do you guys think? Comments about this beer? Fruity, um, I get dark fruits. What do you get, Chris? A hint of diacetyl, but not in a bad way. Um, yeah, it's, it's very robust flavor. You know, you get a lot of... Uh, fruit to it, a lot of things that you that you would maybe think you would get in a uh, in an ale, but not in a you know super clean lager. Any other um, comments on this beer? Easy to distinguish this from the uh, Shinerbach, right? Ryan's got a uh, comment. Just a general comment. Like I always think of the style. At least like Bagby did a nice collaboration with Bierstadt with their Tamave. Um, I think it was Tamave 13. And I always kind of think of it as like it's that in between like a Oktoberfest Märzen and like a Schwartz beer. It's kind of like bridges that gap. That's kind of how I thought about that style. Um, so anyway, just my comment on. Great. Okay, let's keep going to the tour. Back in the day, we talked about the decoction mashes and everything. Uh, back then, they were probably doing the decoction mashes, but today they're probably not doing it, right? Probably not, I would guess. I, I don't know. I don't know enough about this brewery to know how they're actually doing it. Um, but they, uh, the only thing that they said on it is that, okay, it's brewed with four malts and well water. <laughs> okay, it doesn't tell you which four malts, you know, or which well it was brewed in. But so I, I put it up there because that's the only information I had. Um, so it's 2014 is when they reverted the name back to, uh, or reverted the name. I said reverted to Samson because Samson was a name they had used, you know, back when they were in the, the Soviet days. So let's talk, let's keep moving along here. Let's talk about the Dunkel style. Um, this one, this is sort of the description of ri uh, a rich brown lager with deeply toasty, bready, and malty flavors without roastiness. So you think, I always think of this as sort of the, I always think of the, the bready, breadiness and soft breadiness flavors and things like that. 
And it's, uh, you know, also in the same vein, you're at about four and a half to 5.6% ABV. So it's um, traditional, this one traditionally, they would use a decoction mash on it. Um, although I'm sure a lot of the breweries are not still doing it that way. Uh, Munich malt would be, would be key to this, this, this beer. So uh, we've got, I think we've got, um, we've got, I think a couple examples of this one. So it'll be interesting to, to see, to see uh, the difference between them. Um, Iinger is a, a brewery, a small that was bre uh, brewed in a, that came in a small Bavarian village in Ayang in 1878, and uh, they have uh, this beer that is had has wide acclaim, and including uh, a, a a listing on the uh, BJCP example list. Um, they got a big, uh, really good reputation. It's about five percent ABV, so it's going to be uh, something that's going to be uh, um, similar in, in in alcohol to some of the previous examples that we had. But I think you'll you'll pick up some very different flavors from this beer. So let's uh, let's we'll pass this beer around here. Again, if you look at the uh, color of the beer, and you'll see that it's not a black beer; it's a maybe a it's deepening uh, deep amber color. The first thing that I get out of this is that that deep malt uh, flavor, the melanoidins that are coming out. Uh, no, I have I have I have some okay. uh, melanoidins coming out from it. Um, what else? You guys get anything else from this? How would you contrast this to the uh, the Czech uh, dark lager? Less dark fruits, so the esters are. There's a lot less esters in this. It's very bready and malty flavor to it. Any other comments on it, Todd? A little bit drier, a little bit drier. Okay. Um, I think we have. Yeah, we have another one we want to pass. Let's pass this one around too, the Weltenberger Foster Barrack Dunkel. Um, and then we can talk about the, then we can talk about the difference between the two. So this one, um, this one, uh, I have not had this one before. Yeah. Time out. <laughs> Give them a moment. All right. Well, let's pass them around to those that are ready, and we'll we'll just keep circling. Yeah, let's let's pass it around to those that are ready. See, you caught I do, up already. I do I do want you to taste these ones together if you can. If we can taste the two dunkels together, it'll be really good. So, this one really struck me when I start when I started doing a little bit of research on on this brewery, because um, this is what it looks like on the approach to the brewery. You take a boat into the brewery right here. You can get in there. You can get a tour in there. Um, there you go. Uh, so you you guys are come on up here and tell you tell us your story about how you're on the boat. They the these guys are okay. The monastery was established in 45 A.D. Okay, the brewery was established in 1050. So that's, I don't know too many breweries that are older than 1050, so I kind of believe them. But they do. <laughs> they started brewing before awards even existed. There weren't, wasn't such a thing as an award. So, um, yeah, so maybe they figured out that they needed to start winning some awards or start entering it. But they uh, advertise themselves as being the world's oldest dark beer. I'm sure this is not what the beer tasted like in 1050.
this is in a, uh, it's a monastery, Weltenberger Monastery. I don't know exactly where uh, in Germany. Chuck, you want to come up here and tell us a little bit about this? Come on. Tell us a little bit about the brewery. No, because I've not been here. This is the first time I've had this beer, actually, really. So uh, hopefully hopefully everyone's go going to try at least one beer that they haven't had before. So uh, for me, this is the beer. So now differences between, between these two beers, the Eyinger beer and the uh, Weltenberger. What do you guys think? Differences, differences. What do you think? You said toastier for the Weltenberger? Chris? I get the. I think the the, the roasty flavor could be the um, where that kind of drier finish is coming from. Um, it definitely doesn't kick me uh, with that big malt ready malt flavor in the front end like the uh, Iinger one does. You know. So, but this is what you do if you if you want to to study one of the uh, beer styles. I would highly recommend going and finding as many examples as you can, good examples of that style and sit down and try them because you'll find out that they that they taste different and you can start drawing like a circle around where you think that style will be because it's not a it's not a pinpoint it's not a this is what that style is and this is the perfect beer for that style it's more like there's a circle and you can you can figure out where you want to play in that circle if you're going to if you're going to make your own beer and so understanding that the best way to understand that is to is to um, pick up a number of different samples of that one style and taste them at the same time any other comments about these two dunkels? Yeah, they're both they're both good. They're both listed as 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 classic examples, but they're both different too. Do you guys have a, a does anyone have a favorite between the two other than them both being different? Mike likes the Einger. Einger. Weltenberger. <laughs> I think I like the Eyinger better um, myself just because I love that bready malt flavor that comes out with it. And the Weltenberger has a little bit more of a, I call it like a twist. You know, it's kind of got a twist at the end, and which is interesting. That's ready to move on. We can talk about the next style. There's so many different dark lagers to talk about. And we didn't even talk about ales. We're just talking about lagers. Chris? Oh, yeah. OK, so this is 4.7 and 20. And 5%. I'm not sure I have a IBU on this one. We could probably look it up and find it. 10.52, gravity. Um, OK. So let's talk about uh, Schwartz beer's uh, style. And this one is a uh, dark German lager that balances roasted flavors with moderate hot bitterness. This is one where you're expected you're going to get a little bit of, of roastiness to it. Um, I've heard them say it's sometimes called a black pills. So typically you'll see these, and these will end up being being uh, black beers. Whereas a lot of these beers that you tried were were uh, you know deep deep amber or even even not even deep amber in some cases. So let's um, let's bring out a uh, sample of a uh, great example of this one. That's this is easily accessible. Some of you probably tried this. This is a Kalstritzer Schwartz beer. And uh, 
Yeah, let's pass these around here. Um, interesting, some interesting facts about this beer. Um, you guys will be interested in the composition, but you can see it's 7% roasted malts in there. So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty significant amount of roasted malts in here. Um, the other thing that was interesting to me was that that um, the for, that was recently reformulated. It was originally a three and a half percent ABV beer. Maybe they figured that was just a little bit too uh, low on the on the pole to compete with everybody else. It was reformulated to four point six percent. Um, yeah, this is so the brewery was founded in 1543, so not the oldest brewery in the world, but still a very old brewery. What, what was that? Yeah. I can take a little bit more, Brian. If you got a little bit more, that's only four percent. Yeah. Did everyone get a pour of this? Everyone's got some of this. Okay. Well, what do you guys think about the uh, Kulstritzer? You like it? Okay. But. Somebody told me it's like the, the Guinness of German beers. Is that Ryan? Did you said that. Yeah, you stole Ryan's yeah. thunder. It's like when I was in Berlin, like if you you generally have like a, a Pilsner on a vice beer, there's a third maybe beer. It would be this beer, and it was everywhere. Yeah, so that's why I said it's kind of like the Guinness of like Germany in that respect. It's it's a big brewery. It's cheap. It's readily available, but it's also it's a good beer. It's got that lager, um, the cleanness to it, but yet the there's a roastiness, and you get it a lot on the finish. It's a very when you ha whenever you have a lot of roast uh, in in your beer, you tend to get this this dryness on the finish, uh, and that's what you're getting. You're getting this dry finish that's largely from the roasted malts. Now notice how dark the beer is. Also, this really is compared to what we've been trying in the other dark beers. This is this is a uh, uh, very, very close to a black beer. What do you guys think of this one? What, any comments on it? Any thoughts on what do you guys get out of it? Oh, a hint of cola. Yeah, now that you mentioned that, yeah. It, it does have uh, a lot of those kinds of flavors to it. cola without the sugar and with some alcohol in it what else what else you guys get Mike what do you get Mike would rather drink this than Guinness yeah 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 okay anybody else The beer's what? Yeah. So when I saw that one, they had it. This, this beer they had in the cans and in the bottles. And I went straight for the cans, because it. Well, it's not that. It, I think it's it's fresher. I think you're going to get fresher flavors. You're going to get out of the cans. If you guys have the choice between the cans and bottles, maybe I should have maybe I should have got both of them, and so you could try them side by side. But I I think you're going to find that more and more you're going to get more of these different beers in cans, which is not only great for the environment, but also great for you know us that are drinking this thousands of miles away from the source. Of course, all these beers may not always be brewed in the, in the country of origin anymore. You know, so a lot of uh, the breweries are, the, the, the larger breweries are setting up uh, spots in, that are more local. So that that's also good for us too, because you're brewing things uh, locally than you know, the issues of transporting things on boats to get here and the freshness of the beer is usually better. So 
that's something I think we have to look forward to. All right. Let's talk about the next style. No, wait, wait a second. I think we have I think we have a video here, right? We have a video to play, right? There you go. May the Schwartz be with you. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, the Bach style, Dunkel's Bach. So we tried uh, earlier. We tried. Uh, um, I don't know if some of you had a chance to try uh, uh, one of the Mybox that was going around earlier in the in the day. But uh, Mybox is a lighter version of the, a box. A box beer can be light, a light uh, colored, or a pale colored, or a dark colored. And if it's a dark colored Bach, it will be called a Dunkel Bach. So I don't have a, uh, we're not gonna pass around a sample of this because we're gonna move on to the uh, Doppelbach style of it. Um, but they're, they're very similar to it. So it's a strong, dark, malty German lager, uh, emphasis on malty rich and toasty qualities. So you can see here now what's different now than everything else we've tried up until now is look at the ABV, it's 6.3 to 7.2. So the difference is now we're like we're we're starting to look at some bigger, bigger uh, dark lagers, but yet the IBUs are still fairly low, 20 to 27. This typically is using darker, uh, using Munich and Vienna malts and darker malts to to create this this kind of a beer, and it's all about make, getting that clean German lager you know uh, flavor to it. So that's it for the uh, the Dunkel's box style. Let's talk a little bit about the Doppelbach, which is basically just a bigger version of this. Uh, Doppelbach can come in both uh, pale and dark colors. It's more common to, to, to be in the darker, the darker versions. So the origin from this is um, when we pass around these samples, we're going to want to pass around. We're going to have uh, two samples we're going to pass uh, around. So if you do have anything left in your glasses, you know, take your time, but you know, we'll We'll give it a little bit of time, but we'll empty them out before we get to passing these out. So the origin of this is really comes from uh, um, the monks in uh, St. Francis of Paula, and they created uh, Salvatore, a, a, Bach, a Doppelbach called Salvatore. Salvatore. And um, that Bach became uh, real famous, and there were several other, other breweries that were tried to copy them. And they would come out even with the same name. And so there were some disputes that were going on there. And, and eventually what was settled on is that they had, to, they had to use different names. And so they ended up coming up with all these names. And they all end with A-T-O-R. So you see uh, different things like that. I don't know if you guys tried uh, the, the Doppelbach and the Icebach that I made uh, during the uh, pandemic. I had the vaccinator and I had the eradicator. And so this is, you can have some fun with the naming of all the, uh, your Doppelbox. That's one of the, one of the fun parts about it. Uh, so it's basically a stronger, richer version of a Bach. Now you see the ABV at seven to 10%. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass around two, two different uh, versions here. Um, the, we call it the dueling Doppelbox. Uh, we're gonna have Paul Enner Salvatore, the, the classic. And then we're going to have the Eyinger uh, Celebrator. And yes, I better drink out. Is this like what? Roberto's? Oh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. It's like, we call it Birdo's. Yeah, Birdo, anything with the Birdo's on it is authentic. Phil Birdo's, Adalberto's, Phil Birdo's, Roberto's, Alberto's.
So we'll let this go around for a minute. All right, so does anyone, anyone notice anything different about these beers? <laughs> the bottles look different, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. Um, yeah, so there's some stats on here. You can see um, there's not a color stat that I listed up on here, but uh, that's for you guys to figure out. Um, but they're both listed as a, um, you know, as classics or as style, uh, you know, examples in BJCP. So it lets you know that, you know, there's a range at which you can you can see for these styles. Chuck, Chuck, got a comment? My first experience in Munich, we went to the Polliner Cafe, and in, in Bavaria, they always have three styles of beer on tap, which would be the Weiss, the, the Helles, and the Dunkels. And they always serve the Weiss beer in a half-liter flute, and the Dunkels and the, and the Helles would be in a one-liter mug. But I saw they had Salvatore, and I said, oh, I'd like the Salvatore. So the the gal behind the bar, she opened two half-liter bottles and poured them into a one-liter mug. Needless to say, I was very happy I wasn't driving. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah, you can't, buy, you can't buy a single bottle, maybe. You have to buy a double bottle. That's an interesting story. Um, comments about these, uh, these, uh, the dueling doppel box. What do you guys think? Why do you, uh, Corey says he likes the celebrator uh, better. Why do you like the celebrator better? It has a l less roast character, you're saying, or? Other, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I missed that. The goat on the bottle, right here. It's got two goats on there. Oh, okay. Okay. Mike. So Mike's Mike's saying he likes the uh, celebrator better. He feels like the uh, Salvatore has a little bit more roast. Uh, to it, yeah, yeah. Which one? Which one are you saying is both of them? Cloying and malty. That's what I'm hearing. Other descriptors. I think in the um, in the past when I've had this, I think it's even been more uh, under attenuated. I mean, it been been a. Uh, I think this may is one beer that maybe has changed over the years, where it's they've gone, you know, from a little bit more attenuation. Corey. Mm. 
Maybe if they put both these in cans, it would be better, right? Chuck, how does this compare to tasting it at the brewery? <laughs> at the big, at the top of that leader that you had, how does it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any uh, anything else on this one? All right. All right, we're gonna. There's unfortunately there's still more. There's still more we got to go through. There's ice box. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna throw an ice box at you today, but you're gonna you use your imagination on this one, uh, because it falls in the same category as the box. Um, so it's a stronger version of this. Usually a stronger version. Sometimes um, if you listen to the BJCP guidelines, they say. No, it doesn't mean it's a stronger version. It just means it's iced, you know? And so they could be, it could not be stronger, but I think usually they're stronger beers. <laughs> so you see nine to 14%, it's a pretty big beer. Uh, uh, Kohlenbacher is an example of that. You should pick one up if you can. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the Baltic Porter style. This is a strong, dark, malty beer. Uh, Sean Bush had a great presentation on this style. Um, which, which is available on YouTube if you missed it. Yeah, there's a plug for uh, our YouTube. So um, typically this would be uh, typically this would be Munich and Vienna, uh, deep bittered malts. Um, again, it says Baltic Porter, but it is a lager, but it's sort of very much in the vein of a of a of a porter, and you'll get that in the. I think you'll get that when you start looking at some of the the complexity of the esters that that are in the the beer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh well no this is uh Munich and Vienna and it should say and deep bitter dark malts. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not deep bitter Munich. Um so this is uh this Baltic Porter right here. I should advance to the next slide. Javiats. That's what it says, Javiats. Javiats. Okay, this is, uh, this brewery opened in 1865 in Poland, in Zwijk, Poland. And uh, um, they've been brewing this to this recipe, they claim, since 1881. So uh, quite a long time. Still not the oldest brewery in the world, but um, it's listed as a uh, Baltic Porter example in BJCP. This one is 9.5% uh, and, and 45 IBUs, so it's a little bit higher on the um, alcohol and also the bitterness level. So thoughts on this beer? Salty, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Salty. Licorice. Yeah, I get licorice out of this too. Yeah. And so you get this sort of a lot of complexity to this beer, I think, which is the one thing that I do like about it. There's a lot going on in it. What else? What else you guys get out of this? Yeah. Anything else, Jim? What do you get out of this beer? Licorice. Yeah. It's some like uh, plum, plum. I get some plum. Sort of like dark fruits. Um, prune. Somebody said prune. Yeah, I think some of the dark fruits come through a little bit more than some of the other styles. Very different from that, you know, the the Doppelbox and the Munich Dunkels, right? All right. Um, we'll talk a little bit about brewing 
dark loggers. Um, so basically, there's there's lots of different things that you might want to do for the different ones, but um, you know, if you can use Munich malt up to 100% if you want when you're brewing. You can mix it with uh, with Pilsner malt. Um, you can use you know pale uh, you know two row lager malt if you if you want. Um, or you can brew it. I think you can use the malts as sparingly if you want to do it just for coloring. To get uh, you know take a dark take a light lighter beer that you want to make it into a darker beer. It might be something to think about. For a big brew, you know, if you take big brew and you wanted to add something to it, you could make a dark beer out of it. Um, if you're trying to enhance the malt flavor to go after some of the Doppelbox or bulk, uh, you can either you can either do a decoction malt or you can use melanoidin malt. Arom aromatic malt is one that can also be used to help you with uh, uh, malt uh, aromatics. And I think probably a general rule here with most of these beers would be to avoid crystal malts. You know, so most of them are fairly well, fairly well attenuated. Um, or if they're not attenuated, they're not attenuated. Um, it's because of, of kind of the, you know, the bigness of the beer. Um, yeah, so I, that's what I would say in terms of the malt. In terms of hops, I don't think there was any of these beers where you'd say the hops are the dominant flavor in any of these beers, but some of them had more than others. Uh, I think you'd want to stick with hops that weren't going to be, that weren't going to give you a searing bitterness or any searing flavors to them or something that's really going to, you know, your typical IPA hops that are going to really, you know, uh, pop and hit you in one particular way. So typically, you know, a lot of these hops they would use. Uh, I like to use uh, like the Hal Halatara derivatives uh, for bittering and Noble hop hops for finishing, but you can do you can mix and match and do other things if you want to. Usually, there's most of these didn't have a lot of hop aromatics to it, so you want to be real light on anything that you might do with finishing hops. For um, water, you have to be concerned about the uh, pH of your mash and the, the dark malts are going to drop the pH of your mash. So you if you're going to use RO water or something that doesn't have any buffering that you want some calcium carbonate in there. Uh, I think you could use San Diego filtered water. Um, you could do that depending on your region uh, and even use uh, some RO water to try to soften it, soften it up. Um, you want to avoid usually avoiding high sulfate water because that would accentuate the uh, harsh bitterness in the finish. So the ones that the ones that had sort of the dry finish or the roastiness to it, they they might not do so well if you had really hard water or a lot of sulfates in the water. Um, yeast that you might use. There's a lot of choices now for lager yeast. So um, all I would tell you is that. You want to make sure that you have a good yeast starter. You're fermenting at lower temperatures. You want to make sure that you have good, healthy yeast. And so, the number one thing would be to, you know, build up a nice starter for the yeast. One of the things that I like to do, especially if you're doing a bigger beers, like if you wanted to brew two dark lagers, maybe you brew the first one for one of the ones that we had for the standard gravities, and then take all of that yeast and then use it to make your your Doppelbach, something like that. You know, the, the bigger beers that have a, a lot of healthy yeast. And then um, other brewing techniques, if you want to do decoction mash, that's one thing you can do if you're going to do an infusion match with mash with mashing, which is a little bit simpler, then you could consider using melanoidin malts or other things like that. And some of the dark lagers, I think um, you wouldn't want that. So like if we looked at the international dark lager, that was pretty devoid of a lot of uh, melanoid and flavor to it. It was more of a sort of a caramel flavor uh, darkness to it. And, and so in that case, you wouldn't need to, to do anything to that. And fermentation, I think um, fermenta fermenting lagers, if you can start the lagers at lower temperatures, there's a lot of debate about this, but my preference would be to start the lagers at lower temperatures, 50 degrees, or maybe even lower than that. And then it seems like you can start raising the temperature 
after fermentation starts, you can start raising it up to, to make sure that it, that it ferments out properly and that you can still get good lager fermentation with that. I would like to make the point that in San Diego in the winter times, as you can see, it can get pretty cold and you can actually, for those of us that don't have refrigeration, uh, you can brew your, your lagers in the winter time if you pick the right time of year. And so if you're thinking about it, think about your, your brewing season and your brewing plan. Try to brew your lagers, you know, in the, in the, in the wintertime. Even if you are using a, a, a fermentation control, uh, you, you'll still use less energy if you're doing it in the, in the wintertime. It'll be easier for you to do it. Yeah. Oh, I just, uh, just using like a straight oxygen, pure oxygen to oxygenate. Uh, so it, it's just, you could, you know, if, if you look at the, if you're using the oxygen in the, you know, in the air and you're just popping the air in there, you, you're going to get a lot less oxygen in there if you really want to get a good healthy fermentation. So using, you know, pure oxygen can help you uh, for yeast propagation. And lagering, um, I think uh, lagers, lager means to store in German. So this is the typical thing you would do. You would brew the beer, and then you're going to just let it sit and let it lager. And, and what will happen is it will clean up. It, things will drop down out of it. And that's a typical way to do it. Now we have, you, we have findings and other things that we can do to try to accelerate the, that process. But this is the typical way that that you would do this for a lot of these a lot of these beers. Um, if you're going to bottle, then my suggestion would be to stay away from uh, natural uh, conditioning of the bottles. Just uh, force carbonate them. The thing that's important about a lot of these beers is to have them, you know, uh, devoid of of yeast and haze and things like that. I think you'll notice that in all the beers we tried today that there weren't any hazy beers that we were trying. So something that you should pay attention to, how are you gonna make sure that your beer is clean? You make sure that your beer, you get all the flavors that you're looking for and you're not picking up yeast flavors and other things like that. And that's it. Questions? Stan. Yes, <laughs> did you hear? Yes, you could do that, Stan. I think you should do that. I think that's a great idea. So you, you want to use the big brew as, a, as your yeast starter, <laughs> essentially. But, but you'll make good beer out of it, too, in the process. So I, I always think about that in, that in that manner, is that you want to build up this big starter. And then when you read about how, much, how big your starter has to be, it's pretty much a whole batch of beer. Why don't you just make your batch of beer and then use, use all the yeast that you get from that to make your bigger beer? So that's the way kind of I think about it. Chris, you had a question. I have a couple of comments on the ingredient slides. So on the malt side, you mentioned Krafa malts. There's a very important distinction between Krafa and Krafa special. So Krafa 1, 2, and 3 are basically pale chocolate, chocolate, and black patent that are German version. The Krafa special ones are the debittered versions of those that are dehusked. So make sure most homebrew shops are only going to carry the special version, even if they don't mention it specifically. But as a pro brewer, I can buy either version of all those. So you need to be very careful about that. Uh, for the hops, you mentioned a bunch of the Hallertau varietals or things derived from that. But you can get regular Hallertau middle fruit for pretty cheap. And that will probably give you the most traditional character. And it's generally not very expensive. And that can also be grown in different regions. So make sure you're getting the German version. And finally, on the yeast, a yeast that you didn't mention that I really like is the uh, Saf Lager W3470. It's really great dry yeast that performs well, works great in all types of German and American lagers. I've used that for corn lager, rice lager, uh, Helles, Meritzen, Vienna lager. It really is a great all-around lager yeast, especially for the German ones. Yeah, that's the yeast that I used in the, uh, um, the Helles that I passed around. Yeah. Yeah, good, good tips. Thanks, Chris. Um, anybody else have any 
tips, questions, comments? Okay, thank you very much.